Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We ask you, Lord, that you'd open our hearts to receive what you have for us today. Guide and direct me, Lord, today. Deliver your word. Direct us to receive what you have for us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we have your word to turn to every week. It's a wonderful name. Amen. Mark mentioned earlier today the message is without a doubt. How many of you go through life without a doubt? <laughs> we wish we could. Now, there, sometimes doubt can be healthy, but sometimes doubt can be a sin. I'm going to look at that. It's okay to, to doubt certain things if you don't have all the facts and, and you don't have everything you need to go on, but. It's a blessing when we can trust the Lord and trust His Word without any doubt. We're going to look at doubt this morning. Mark 9, 23-24 says, Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Now this was a man whose son was demon-possessed, would throw himself into the fire and do all manner of things. and They were asking Jesus to heal him. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And the, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I've never been in that position. We believe, but yet help our unbelief. Lord, I believe that you can heal me. But I'm, I'm not getting to where I need to be. Help me in my unbelief right now. It's okay to ask God to help you in your unbelief. Because even though there's that part of us that believes that God can do what He says, there's that other part of us that doesn't believe He's going to do it for us. We doubt it. Yes, He did it for that other person, but why would God do that for me? Why does God want to heal me? Why does God want to take care of this in my life? And that doubt can get in our way. And we need to be like this father and cry out, Lord, I believe. I know you can do it. But help me right now in my unbelief. That seems like a contradiction, but it really isn't. So there are different sources of doubt. Where does doubt come from? Why do we have so much problem believing? Especially the things of God. Genesis 3.1 shows us where the first source of doubt came from. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Notice the first thing he does with Eve is he begins to put doubt in her mind. Did God really say that? Are you sure? That happens to us sometimes. When we're, we're praying and asking for God to do something in our lives, and the little voice can, are you sure God's Word said He would do that? <laughs> well, go and check. <laughs> Hold it up. Say, yes. It says right here that God wants to meet all my needs. But see, Satan likes to try to just put that little bit of doubt in there, get it started. The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, You shall not eat it, nor touch it, lest you die. Well, what did the serpent say? He said, You won't surely die. Come on. Really? You really believe that? You really take God at His word? Well, He did die. She didn't die immediately. From that moment that she gave in to that temptation, she began to grow old. <laughs> we know how much fun that is. <laughs> Imagine if you could have stayed at that perfect age. I still believe that that perfect age is something that we'll probably wind up being in our glorified body is around the age of 30. I always believe that because that was the age that Jesus was when he entered into his ministry. That was the age that you had to be to enter into the priesthood. It seemed to be an important age. And you think back, that was a pretty good age. You weren't a kid anymore, but you weren't old either. 
didn't have all the aches and pains. The world system is another thing that puts doubt in our mind. The world is always trying to get you to doubt God. This classic humanism says that doubt, while uncomfortable, is absolutely essential for life. Rene Descartes said, if you would be a real seeker after truth, it is necessary that at least once in your life you doubt as far as possible all things. So that's what the world wants you to think. It should come to a point, if you want to really know the truth, you got to at some point doubt everything. This is similar to what the founder of Buddhism said, doubt everything, find your own light. It's not what God says. God doesn't want us to doubt everything. God wants us to believe the things that He has done for us. He wants to believe the things that He is saying to us. We don't need to doubt God in order to find the truth. The truth. See, that goes back where? The Garden of Eden. Did God really say that? Come on. See, that's where it begins. Begin to doubt everything. And then you can start all over and find the real life. That's the world's lie. 1 Timothy 6, 20-21 says, O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust. Avoid the profane and idle babblings and contradiction of what is falsely called knowledge. God tells Timothy just the exact opposite. He says, avoid the profane ba babblings. That's what the world is offering, a bunch of profane babblings, contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. Just because they call it knowledge doesn't mean it's the truth. There is a difference. We need to understand that. We can put a professor's hat on. We can put a lab coat on. Look like we're really smart. We can grow our hair out like Einstein. Does that mean that what we're saying is real knowledge? It can still be babblings and contradictions if it goes against God's Word. Where did we begin to think that man's knowledge is greater than God's knowledge? In this world, that's what people think. Mankind is smart enough to know more than God. God got it wrong on these few things, but now we have it right. And we're going to correct it. Really? It says, by professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. When we turn to the world's knowledge, we stray from the faith. 1 Corinthians 6, 2-2. 6-2, through 8, excuse me. I tell you, I'm having a little trouble. I decided I needed to go on a diet this week, so I'm functioning on you know, less fuel than I normally have. And it takes usually several days to start adjusting to that. And I'm just, just now getting into that adjusting period, so if I, if I flub up a little here. That's, that's where the lack of energy is coming from. I don't need all that food. I don't need to doubt, doubt God. God told me I need to do this, so I'm going to do it. <laughs> Amen. So you can all keep me to it. So just forgive me if I flub up here a little bit. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified our Lord of glory. So Paul's saying we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. It's a mystery, the things of God. See, they were known before these ages even began. So how can we turn to God and say, God, we know more than you? God existed before we were even around. God created us. We didn't create God. That's the problem in the world today. The world believes they created God in their image. It's not what my Bible says. God created us in His image. We are the imagers of God. God is not the image of us. He doesn't change as we change and decide who we are and change who we think we are. When we begin to change away from God's Word, we're getting further and further from being His image. God knew before the beginning of the ages. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, 
but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to teach you? That's where the truth is enlightened to us. If you don't understand God's Word, you're saying, well, you know, it's just one book. You know, you're always going back to this one book. How can that one book tell me everything I need to know? Let the Holy Spirit teach you. Before you open up the Bible, pray, God, by your Holy Spirit, teach me today something new from your Word. And He will. You'll find that there's probably a lot of scriptures I'm using today that I've used many times. But God is showing me a different truth and a different application for that for our lives. He'll do that with you every time you open His Word. Are you opening His Word? Or is your Bible just collecting dust? A dusty Bible is not a good, a good sign at all. A worn out Bible is a good sign. I study Bible at home. I was looking at it and thinking, it's about time maybe I need to get another one. I say the same thing. It's starting to fall apart. That's good. Keep those old falling apart Bibles. I have a few of them because you can go back and see what you marked up back then compared to what you're marking up now. And you'll see a change. That God is revealing even more truth. It says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can we know them because they are spiritually discerned. So when we don't understand that true knowledge comes from God, the world can begin to make us doubt by throwing its knowledge at us. The world's knowledge is quite often proven to be wrong. Yes, we can make some amazing things. We can do some amazing things. Man has learned a lot of incredible things. I think of my grandmothers who lived to be over 100 years old, both of them. Both of them went from horse and buggies to the space age in their life's lifetime. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. The increase in knowledge that they saw. If you wanted to get from one place to another, you got on a horse and buggy. When they were children, they watched men walk on the moon and beyond. What an amazing feat in that short amount of time. But God's Word didn't change in that time. God's Word never changes. Man didn't get any smarter than God. Man just invented a bunch of stuff. It didn't make him smarter than God. I mean, technology can be amazing. It can be a great tool, but it can also be a trap. The technology we have today is a trap as well as a tool. Is it trapping you? Are you spending more time in your technology than you are with God? If you are, get rid of it. He says if your eye deceives you, pluck it out. It's better to go into eternity with one eye than to be to burn in hell. Our technology deceives us sometimes. Don't rely on technology. It's a good tool. That's all it is. It's a tool. Like when you're working on your car, it's easier to undo a bolt if you have the right wrench. Sometimes you need a tool. And technology can be a good tool for study. But we're so caught up in our technology, we think it's everything. What if it was taken away from us? It could happen. The grid could cr cr crash. You have no phones, no electricity no, for a while. How many people can survive that? Yeah. I mean, really. But if you see it just as a tool, but not as your everything, you won't, you won't crash. But don't let it bring doubt into your mind. Another thing that brings doubt is spiritual immaturity. Are you growing up as a Christian? Are you remaining immature? The saying we used to use in the jewelry business. Say that a person could have 10 years experience or they could have one year experience 10 times. <laughs> you understand the difference? <laughs> you might be doing something for 10 years, but if you're doing the same thing and not growing and maturing and not getting better, you really don't have experience. You can't sit and say, oh, I got 10 years experience, really. So why are you doing the same thing you've been doing for the last 10 years? 
There's a big difference. Remember that you can have 20 years experience, or you can have one year's experience 20 times, and you can go out what number you want to throw out there. It's the same with being a Christian. Are you the same today as you were when you first accepted Christ as your Savior? Or are you growing up? I did a message one time on the difference between the meat and the milk of the Word. That we need to desire meat. Get off the milk. Paul says you're but like a bunch of little babies. You still want to have your formula. But it's time to get on and chew the meat. Yeah, there are parts of God's Word that we got to chew on it. you got to chew it good before you swallow it. We need to move on to that. A lot of people, they prefer to just live off of the formula. It's a lot easier. Just sit there with your bottle and just give me the basics. But that's not what God wants. He wants you to mature. Spiritual immaturity can cause doubt to come into your mind. Ephesians 4.14 says that we should no longer be children. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Don't be children any longer. When you're children, you're tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine that comes along. Be a mature Christian. The more you mature, the more you, you get into God's Word and begin to understand it, the less the world can blow you around. You become more solid, more grounded. James 1, 5-8 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. How do you mature? Where do you get that wisdom? You get it from God. Who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. When you allow doubting in your life to cause you to be blown about, like a wave on the sea, driven by the tossing wind. It says you're a double-minded person. Get your mind set on the things of God. Then the things of the world will not bring doubt into your life. They will not toss you around. Because you'll know when you're hearing something that doesn't sound right, it's not right. Why? Because it doesn't line up with God's Word. Bottom line. I know we don't like instruction manuals, especially the men in here. That's just our nature. We throw the instructions aside and try to do things on our own. It's just the way we do things. And then our wives come along and say, did you read the instructions? <laughs> no. They had instructions? I mean, when I put it together, I wasn't supposed to have a whole pile of leftover parts. <laughs> Maybe they're supposed to do something. But that's what happens. God gave us the instruction manual. But we ignore it. Greatest book ever written. God's Word was given to us for a reason. And if you doubt that I've done messages, you can go back and find them on how we know that it's the Word of God. There's so much evidence, external evidence, internal evidence. So much evidence that proves it's the Word of God. It's not like any other book written in history. It has survived every attempt to destroy it. We still have it. It's still being proven correct. It's God's Word. So rely on it. He gave it to you for a reason. So what is the cure for doubt? We want to get rid of our doubt, don't we? Yeah. We don't want to go through life being tossed to and fro. We want to believe, have faith. You know, doubt is the opposite of what? It's the opposite of faith. Faith is believing. Doubt is, un is not believing. One thing we got to do is confess our doubt is sin. Did you know it's a sin to doubt God? That's a sin. Now, it's not the same thing as saying, you know, if I tell my wife I'm going to do a particular thing a certain way and she doubts that I can do it, that's not a sin. That's maybe from experience. <laughs> I saw you try that once before. <laughs> Didn't come out so well. That's a different kind of doubt. There are doubts like that that come from experience, you know, in life. But I'm talking about doubting God, doubting God's Word. That's a sin. Psalm 106, 67 says, We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. 
Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember the multitude of your mercy, but rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. You read the story of the Exodus when they came to the Red Sea. Here all of a sudden the armies of Egypt are coming behind them, and what do they do? They begin to doubt God. Moses, what did you do to us? You brought us here to get killed. We should have stayed in Egypt. Oh, we missed the garlics and the leeks in Egypt. We should have stayed there. We had plenty of food. Now we're all going to die. Immediately they begin to doubt. What does it say? It says it was a sin. We have sinned with our fathers. Because when they got out of Egypt, they saw all the plagues. I mean, come on. God just got done killing the firstborn of all of Egypt. You think that water in front of you is a problem for him? It wasn't a problem. You know, it's a problem for, for mankind. Because they keep trying to change the location of where it may have happened to make it easier. They say, oh, it wasn't really the Red Sea. The Red Sea's too deep. <laughs> God couldn't have split the Red Sea. It had to be the Reed Sea. The Reed Sea is a shallow area. And a wind, a strong wind came along and, <laughs> and blew the water away. And they walked through. And I'm going, well... Okay, first of all, yeah, wind could blow it away, but it didn't, they didn't walk on mud. Even if the wind moved the water, how did it get so dry? And the other problem is, is they're finding the remains of chariots and people in the Red Sea. Not in the Reed Sea. And they're finding them where the Bible says they crossed. God parted the sea. I don't care how he did it. It could have been an earthquake. It could have been a wind. I don't care how he did it. Explain to me the timing. You know, I watch these programs and they say, oh, well, we've looked at this from a scientific point of view and, and it could have been a very strong wind because there was a, a rise in the sea floor there and the wind would have been enough to, to dry a spot out where they could walk across. Okay, well, explain to me how... The Jewish people were right there at the right time to walk across that when the wind blew. Hmm. Who told them to be there? That must have been God. Does God use natural means? He may. But then explain to me how he dried the land too so quickly. Said they walked across the dry land. I know that you can move water aside, but it's still muddy underneath. You know, we sit and try to explain all these miracles away. Don't doubt God. He did what he said he did. The evidence is there. Hebrews 3.12 Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. Don't find an unbelieving heart. That's a doubting heart. It falls away from the living God. Believe God. Trust God. God can do it. He did the things he said he did. And more and more they keep finding the evidence that he did and there's always surprise. Oh, wow! <laughs> we just found something that shows that God must have done this. Well, it was in his book. Why did you doubt it? Did you know, a lot of people don't realize, but for years, until just fairly recently, they said there was no King David. Because they never found anything. They said, if there was a King David, where was his throne? Where was his house? He must have had a palace. We've never found any palace of wrong, wrong anybody named King David. Nothing written about King David. He didn't exist. Well, some archaeologists decided to pick up the Bible and read about where the Bible said King David's palace was. Went to Israel and began to search in that area. And guess what he found? The foundations of David's palace. And they found little seals that they put on documents that had David's name on it. They've proven that there was a King David and now nobody doubts that. Well, for a long time, they said, oh yeah, there was a King Solomon because we know where his mines were, we know where, his, where he kept his animals, but, okay, well, how did Solomon get there if he had no father? I mean, this is some of the things they tell us. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, we believe Solomon, but there was never a David. Well, they've since proven that. And you know what? They're more and more finding things that they said never existed. And how are they finding them? Because these archaeologists in the, in the Holy Land have gotten smart. They found out they look in the Bible and go where the Bible says it is. Instead of all the man's wisdom says it, they find the actual locations. Just like the Bible said. Oh, isn't that, isn't that strange? 
Why didn't they think of that to begin with? They would have saved a lot of years looking for things. <laughs> a lot of money. Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. Faith is the opposite of doubt. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You must believe, not have doubt. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Again, doubt is sin, and we need to confess it to God. And when we confess, when we find ourselves in moments of doubt, doubting God's word, doubting that God can do something for us, confess that sin, and He will forgive you of it. Mark 9, 24, Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Remember those words. Help my unbelief. That's confessing. This man is confessing his doubt. We need to study the evidences of the Christian faith. When you begin to doubt God's word, begin to study the evidence that proves the Christian faith. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Are you ready to give a defense to everyone that asks? Have you studied the proofs of your faith enough that you could, when somebody asks about it, why do you believe this, that you can give them a reason? We're instructed to do that, to give a defense to everyone. Acts 17, 11 says, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, speaking of the people in Berea. It says, and that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Are you doing that? Or are you just taking it for my word? It says you should study the scriptures daily to see if what I'm telling you is really so. That's up to you. That's your job. I do my job and I study it and I try to get it right. Your job is to make sure I'm telling you the way it is. That helps fight doubt. When you go go back and look at it, oh, I really does say that. He didn't take that out of context. Mm -hmm. The way he explained it is right there. Do that. Don't don't trust me. I could get it wrong. I try not to, but I can. I can get it wrong. But you need to be like the Bereans, more fair-minded. The search to think if those things are true. Faithfully study the Word of God. We find these last few things we always come back to. Studying the Word of God is one of them. Are you doing that? That's my challenge. We, you know, we've got the Daily Word back there. If you need a place to start, pick up the Daily Word. Do that daily. At least start somewhere. And then move from there. Um, sometimes it's more helpful like that if you find a, a devotional or a study guide to, to lead you. Um, study the Word of God. So we do here on Sunday morning and Wednesdays. We study the Word of God. We read through it to get it into our beings and then to discuss it. Sometimes there's more discussions than others. But we do that because we want to know what God's Word says. Be a part of that. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith, again, is the opposite of doubt. That comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God. Are you hearing God's Word? Are you letting it speak to you? It's living. God's Word is living. It's not dead. Let it speak to your hearts. But you have to do that. You have to open it. How many of you have a Bible with you today? I didn't bring candy to hand out. We used to give candy to the Bibles. I mean, maybe you have it electronically, that's fine. But we ought to start doing that. I'll bring candy and give it to you if you bring your Bible. Man, we used to never go to church without a Bible. I'm I got to grab mine this morning. I'm getting, you know, I bring it. But you know what? This really isn't bringing it. I'm getting convicted of that. 
Because I used to carry a Bible every Sunday to church. And for no other reason, people can see you got a Bible. When I'm carrying a phone or a computer, people don't see my Bible. I'm not speaking to the world around me when I'm walking around. And, and we need to speak to the world that I believe in the Word of God. And I, need, I was going to grab it this morning and bring it. I forgot I need to make that a habit. I never went to church without a Bible. How many remember those times? Been around a while. Did you know, boy, you got everybody had these fancy covers for your Bibles. And I was looking, man, I want a cover like theirs. It's really nice. Got a nice leather cover and it's all embroidered. Mine's, I guess we're not supposed to cover it. <laughs> but we did, remember? I remember too. That we, you could always tell the new believers. They'd come forward, they'd get saved, and the next week they are bringing the, the, the uh, coffee table Bible with them. Because yeah. they didn't have any other one. Oh, man, a great big old Bible, you know, with the picture of the, the big fancy Bible for a couple weeks. But they didn't care. Nope. They're bringing their Bible. <laughs> like, wow, that's a nice Bible. <laughs> Don't mess it up because you want to put it back on the coffee table. But it, it just, that's how it used to be. Nobody came to church without a Bible. We need to get back to that. For no other reason, I know you can carry it electronically. And yes, it is there. That is God's Word. It does speak to you, but it doesn't say anything to the people around you. And it might be that we need to get used to reading it in real print because this might, this might go away. We just don't know. And my wife has something to share. No. I'm just saying yes, amen. Oh, yes, amen. <laughs> she always has her Bible. First Timothy 4.13 Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. <coughs> Again, give attention to reading your Bible. First Timothy 13.16-17 All Scripture is given to Second Timothy, excuse me. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Sounds pretty important to me. The other thing is to pray. You had to know we're coming back to reading your Bible and praying again. I'm telling you, church, we can't, we can't emphasize that enough. That's the heart of what the church is all about. That's the heart of who we're at. We read God's Word and we speak to God. That's what prayer is. <clears throat> we make prayer so complicated. Prayer doesn't need to be complicated. It's talking to God. Doesn't mean you have to talk to God in King James English. Some of you don't like to pray out because you go, I don't have all those fancy words. Well, God's not expecting fancy words. He doesn't move and act and respond because you spoke something fancy to him. He just wants to hear from you. He knows how you talk. He knows if you have a drawl or you say things funny. He gave you that voice. Talk to him with it. Tell him what you need. We have to ask do we have a past history of answered prayer. When you're praying, sometimes to fight doubt, go back and remember what God has done for you before. When He answered that prayer for you before. Sometimes we forget what God has done for us in the past. We need to remind us, you know, I'm praying for this. I remember when He did this for me. You can do it again. And finally, I'm going to close with a part of the story here. John 20, 24 through 25, the one that most would think about when we speak of doubt. It says, Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. And he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And he can't really play it. Thomas gets a bad rap. But think what he was being asked to believe. <laughs> hey, Thomas, Jesus came back to see, yeah, the one that was crucified a few days ago, the Romans killed, yeah, that one, he just came to see us. <laughs> yeah, Thomas says, yeah, right. Yeah. You, guys are, you guys are pulling a joke on me. And he's going, I'm not going to believe unless I see all these things. 
And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors were shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Think how gentle Jesus came to Thomas. He didn't scold him. He said, Thomas, go ahead and touch these so that you will no longer not believe, but that you will believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. At that point, he didn't have to do what he said he needed to do. He believed. It says, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Every person in this room that is speaking to, blessed are you that have not seen but have believed. If you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead, say, more blessed are you because you're believing and you haven't seen it. I believe it. I've not seen it. I want to see my Lord, but I know He's my Lord. Don't let doubt get in your way. It's more blessed are those who believe without doubting. Without doubting. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. If there's anybody here today struggling with doubting the things of God, I'd like to pray for you. Without anybody looking around, raise your hands up. You can say, yeah, I, I'm doubting. And I need God's help. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Just need to be like that individual that says, God, help me. I believe, but help me in my unbelief. Lord, those that have raised their hands or are struggling with doubt, help them in their unbelief. Because God, they've hear, heard your word many times. The times we just get overcome with doubt. Can it really be true? Speak to them this morning by your Holy Spirit that they will know the truth and the truth will make them free this morning. God, I thank you and I praise you for your word. Help us in your word drive out any doubt in our hearts and minds. Help us be a people of your word and a people of prayer. Prayer. The more we read your word, the more we pray, the more we talk to you, the less we will doubt. And we will see the salvation of the Lord. As Moses spoke to the people at the Red Sea, he told them that they would see the salvation of the Lord. They did. They saw the waters part. Give us faith, Lord, I pray. Faith is the opposite of doubting. Fill us with faith, Lord, to trust you, to follow you, to serve you, Lord. I ask that, Jesus, in your wonderful name. Amen.